Hey folks, you know, I've been threatening for a while to make this video on how to make pizzas at home. And there are tons of recipes on making pizzas. There's tons of videos and books and everything else. But this is something that's a kind of a culmination over 30 years of, of our Saturday night pizza making. Now, when we had Turtle River pasties, of course, we had the store and I had to dabble in pizza making because we had this big, beautiful deck oven that was perfect for making pizzas. We had the dough roller. I was dealing with dough all the time. Made many, many different incarnations of pizzas. And one of the ones I tried to perfect was the cracker crusted pizza, the real thin crust pizza that I grew up eating. And many of you who are Minnesotans grew up eating those pizzas that they ran the dough through a sheeter to get them as thin as they possibly could. And, you know, we loved them. But now, you, you know, a lot of the pizza, the carry-out pizzas, things you get, you know, you, the crust is so darn thick, you think you're getting such a bargain because you're getting so much dough crust, but, you know, you're eating, you're serving a pizza and basically like eating half a loaf of bread with it. Well, if you don't want that, if you want a super thin crusted pizza, you can follow Amy Thielen's advice. This is one of our favorite, Peg and, and my, uh, one of our favorite recipe books is Amy Thielen's The New Midwestern Table. I highly recommend purchasing it, not just for the recipes, but for the, uh, the stories. It's really a fun read. Uh, I got this for my sister, who's really not doing much cooking anymore down in Florida, but she grew up in Minnesota. She grew up, my dad grew up not too far from where Amy's living right now. So it's really fun for us to read her stories about these foods and where they came from. But anyways, in her book, she has a recipe for a cracker crust pizza. Well, you know, I tried it and it's really good. I kept making a few changes, tweaking things, uh, adding some yeast, changing the oil, doing a few things different. You know, like recipes are like guidelines. They are a, a blueprint. They're, they're a, well, not a blueprint. They're more of a kind of a, a starting point that you can deviate off from and, and many good cooks that's what you do you you end up making your own version of something but anyways here's what we've come up with and we will make the pizza here in a little while it's a little early in the afternoon yet but what we're gonna do is do some of the talk about the prep work so this is kind of more uh, workshop stuff than kitchen stuff but you might be wondering, what is the guy doing with a tile cutter and some quarry tiles here on the breakfast bar? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. One is uh, it was six below zero on uh, March 22nd, six below zero this morning. So I didn't want to go out and heat up the workshop. It takes three hours to get it. So it's above freezing in there just to cut a few tiles. And the other reason is that Peggy's at work. So. I'm just going to cut these in the house and show you. But we are going to convert our home oven into a, a deck oven. Kind of a, a version of a deck oven. And I'm going to show you how we do that. Now the other thing that's workshop related is we're, we need a piece of 1 8 inch hardboard. This is the hardboard, the same stuff they make the pegboards out of it, except it doesn't have the holes in it. Although the pegboard probably would work too. But anyways, a two foot by four foot piece of this eighth inch hardboard is, I just looked it up at our local Menard store, is $3.56. And from that, you can cut three, 16 by 18 inch pieces. Now this is what I call a transfer board. And when we make the pizzas, you'll understand why this is such a important piece of equipment. 
that'll last you pretty much forever. So anyways, that's the one piece that we're gonna need. 16 by 18 piece of hardboard by a two foot by four foot sheet. Cut it on the table saw or on a nice uh, circular saw with a miter gauge or something and you can give two to your friends. But we're gonna cut some quarry tile because that's what we line our oven with. And we'll go over to the oven here in a little bit. It's not absolutely necessary you can make this pizza without it. Do it, just do it on pizza pans. Not quite as good and uh, not quite as a, a kind of a professional result. We have had our oven lined with these half inch thick, six inch by six inch unglazed quarry tiles, the same set for over five years. And we've had several other sets uh, over the years with every oven. Every oven we've, we've owned in the last 20 some years has been lined with these. And we used to pull them out. When we weren't making pizza, we'd take them out and store them in a little drawer under the oven. We don't do that anymore. They're in all the time. We have not removed the tiles from our oven in five years. We'll wander over there and take a look at them here in a little bit. But let's cut these tiles, so I'll, uh, I'll zoom in on this here too for you. Okay, so many of you are not going to have a tile cutter. And if you know somebody who does, just have them cut you some. Uh, perhaps the building supply place will cut some for you, or you can possibly etch them with a, a masonry cutting wheel on a... a, a angle grinder or something but anyways again this is not essential to have the tiles but you're going to be glad you have them if you do what we need are six of the full size six inch tiles and then we're going to need three half pieces so we're going to need seven and a half tiles altogether. This one I cut already, so this one I have already made, but we're going to cut this one. Okay, so what we do, we're just going to run, run that wheel right down the center, and then you get the wheel off, and so this piece that forces it down like that, we'll just make a nice clean break and you end up with two equal sized pieces. So now we have our three half pieces and our six full pieces and I'll show you then how we set those in the oven. All right, so let's go in the oven here. Now I'm not going to set those new ones I just cut in here. I'm just going to show you what our old ones are like because I'm late because there's really no need to. Now these are a little bit a little got a little bit burned and that's all from my quiche baking days before I realized that my quiche crusts <laughs> there's so much butter loaded in the crusts and I had the margins so far out that I had butter dripping down not a big deal they just you know that's in five years that's all there is now what's important I wanted to show you is the half pieces go in the back on the shelf because if you're pulling something out of the oven, you don't want those half pieces, which move easier than the full size ones to go tumbling onto the glass. So regardless, take your transfer board or a big cookie sheet or something, cover that glass up whenever you're moving these things in or out of the oven. And of course, if you're going to be removing them, uh, <laughs> do so when they're, when they're stone cold. Now ours is are just in the center rack and this rack is below. If we're baking two things, if, we're, if we need both racks, we put this unlined rack above. But again, this never comes out. We leave it in all the time and we find that our oven may take 15 minutes longer to preheat but once it preheats, it cycles on and off very infrequently. And I think that's a huge plus. We find 
that this oven bakes much more evenly than it did before we had this thermal mass in the oven. So I'm not telling you to keep them in if you don't want to. I'm just telling you it works for us. The other thing is in five years since we have owned this oven, or we've owned it a little longer than five years, we have never cleaned it. We've never activated the self-cleaning feature and it's perfectly clean. And a lot, <laughs> a lot of that's because the anything that would have dripped, dripped onto the tiles. But again, they're in decent shape yet. They've been in there for five years. They have been fired to 500 degrees or more on a weekly basis for five years. And we love them. If you want to modify your oven and turn it into a, a pizzeria oven, as far as I'm concerned, this is the slickest, most economical way to go. All right, we're gonna get started and make our dough here. Now I'm over at the sink. Hopefully it's not too bright with the sun shining in here, but quickly, what I'm going to do is take a quarter cup of, I just, I use just olive oil, not the, the high end stuff, just kind of the cooking variety. A quarter cup of olive oil in in a quarter measuring cup and then that same cup then I'll take I'll get some warm water coming out of the tap here not not piping hot or anything but kind of that 90 90 95 degree and add three quarters of a cup of water so in this bowl we have a quarter cup of olive oil and three quarters of a cup of water and then to that we are going to add a teaspoon of, I just use a coarse kosher salt, teaspoon of salt, kind of a necessary evil, a little bit of sugar. Amy calls for a teaspoon. I, I do more like a half. Sugar for us is kind of just a uh, just uh, food, just something to add to foods. It's, we don't eat it like too many people eat it, I guess. So here's another departure. I've, every time I've made this over the years, I keep ramping up the yeast. I was getting an eighth of a teaspoon, then a quarter of a teaspoon. Now I'm up to roughly a half a teaspoon. Uh, just the instant yeast, the same instant yeast that we use for our bread that we keep in the deepest, darkest corners of the refrigerator. And we'll mix this all up. We'll take it over here to the breakfast bar and hopefully I can show you a little better what we do next. This can all be done easily with the KitchenAid mixer. But, and if you have one sitting on the counter ready to go, you just basically put your, your oil and water and your salt, sugar, and yeast in the the bowl of the of the KitchenAid mixer and add your flour and just keep working that dough hook and slowly adding flour till it cleans the side of the bowl and you're done. That's that's easy. But I find that this dough is so easy to make. It's actually kind of fun that I just I just like to whip it up by hand. So I like to use a rubber spatula. So I just blend the salt, sugar and yeast into that warm water in olive oil and then start out with a cup of I just use unbleached all-purpose flour hopefully it's not grown with much of the glyphosate I I, I kind of trust that company I kind of hope they don't but you never know anyways I'm starting with a cup and we're going to just stir that cup of flour in and make a slurry with that. With the, you know, with the rubber spatula, you can really press that, press that dough down and really blend everything well together like this. And then we'll go ahead and
Well, you couldn't see my scoop and sweep, but remember the scoop and sweep method where we overfill our cup and then just take a knife and flat edge of something and bring it across the top and then you get a pretty accurate measure. And then we're just going to go ahead and stir that second cup of flour in. And we're just going to blend it in the bowl using the rubber spatula. Just keep kind of lifting and turning just until all of the liquid has been incorporated into the dough. And then we will just turn this out onto our work surface here. And now we're done with the bowl and spatula. And then I like to take, oh, probably roughly like, a, I don't know, a third of a cup or so of flour, maybe half a cup, and put that on the work surface and just start working that dough. It's going to start sticking. It's pretty slack dough at this point. And just keep moving it onto your flour and, and grabbing a little bit. Work it some more into that flour that you grabbed. As it starts sticking, just reach over and grab a little bit more. The whole idea is to use the flour on the surface to get enough flour to get a workable dough that we can develop the, the gluten a bit here, but we don't want it we don't want to grab so much that it gets to be a stiff and dry dough. So that's kind of a little bit of a, an acquired feel. As you make this dough, you are just grabbing a little flour, a little bit at a time. And when you get to the point where this dough can be worked without sticking to your hands, much or without really sticking to the surface it's almost better to air a little bit on the a little bit slacker side than have it get too stiff so i'm not going to get too carried away kneading this what i'm going to do is now that i have it at this point i'm just going to keep stretching it and form that skin and then just kind of bunch all my little ends together on the bottom and form a ball. Now we like two doughs. We like two basically roughly 16 inch pizzas. And because the parchment paper and our tiles are only 15, it's a slight oval, which is something we can certainly live with. Um, we, you can get 16 inch parchment paper if you order it online, but generally what's available in the supermarkets is 15, which is fine. So we're going to cut this in half because we want two. Normally I use a little serrated knife, but that would mean I'd have to go and get one. So if you're if you're kind of fussy, you're not great at eyeballing, you might measure these or weigh these. But for my purposes, I bet you that one's a little bit light. I'm just going to kind of eyeball it. And what I'll do is, is form a skin again. And kind of pinch together those ends and just basically make two balls. And then with this flour that's remaining on the work surface, we're going to just press them into the flour. I like to just press them in, flip them over, so we coat both sides. Flatten them down a bit, you'll end up with roughly about a four or five inch round. And you're not going to do much more with them right now at this point. They're really springy. So we're going to just cover these. And I just grab a, 
I just grab a, a dish towel. So we're just going to cover those and let them rest for about 20 minutes. Okay, it's been about 20 minutes and there's really nothing magic about 20 minutes. It's just it gives the dough time to rest. And one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing that is because it's just peganitinate. We're only going to have one of these and we're going to freeze away the other dough. So that's, that's kind of another nice thing about this recipe and these doughs is you can put one in the freezer if it's just the two of you and you can pull this thing out and they thaw out really quickly you can just take it out put it in the refrigerator in the morning and or whatever or just take it out and let it set on the counter till it it thaws and, and becomes workable in a in a pretty short amount of time so they're really almost kind of like a like a fast food but anyways I like to then just the doughs relax and just pat them out to about a six to eight inch circle round and then I'm just going to take the one that we will have at a future date just leave it like that bag it up throw it in the freezer so this one we can we can eat anytime now in the next couple hours doesn't really matter but I did start the oven so the oven's at 500 preheating now remember with those tiles in there they uh, the oven once it gets up to temperature it really doesn't cycle on and off so you're not really wasting energy much by letting that oven preheat a good hour in advance so we'll get back to this probably in about an hour and a half or so well <laughs> well, we're getting ready to put this pizza together. I know the lighting's pretty poor over here, but I thought I'd head over to the West 40 here first and harvest a little basil. So we're just going to snip the tops, which is what we've been doing all along here now for the past three months. Just keep snipping the tops and the side shoots. They just keep coming back. So I'll just grab a handful here ah, that's probably good never head over here in a bit and put this whole works together okay time to make some pizzas so we're going to take our dough here and kind of key is having enough flour Remember, flour is our friend from rolling out our pasty dough and other things. We want enough flour so that the, the dough is not going to stick. And remember, too, that we're steering this rolling pin. And I like to do an, a big oval and then kind of flip it 90 degrees. Have some flour sitting out in case you need it. Add a little bit more. And remember, you're kind of driving this rolling pin to try to get yourself roughly a, a 16 inch diameter dough. Now, because our, remember our parchment and our tiles are 15 inches by 18 inches, it's going to be slightly an oval. Now, but one nice thing about this dough is that it's really durable at this point. So you don't want to stick a finger through or, or a fist through, but get your, get your arm underneath it to support it. Get both arms underneath it. Shake off that excess flour. And you can find that this, this dough at this point is really nice and durable. So what we have, remember our piece of hardboard, I put a piece of parchment on it to cover that. So it's basically 15 inches by about 18 inches. So now we're going to put our dough out onto our parchment. And kind of evenly distribute it. And you can go ahead and roll it while it's on the parchment a little bit, if you really kind of want to maximize the amount of surface, 
Let's just remember this is not going to be a 16 inch round dough because our parchment isn't 16 and our tiles aren't so that looks pretty good. This little extra flour we don't need. Okay, so now we have our, our dough. And what I use for a sauce, in this case, is just some canned tomato sauce. And I added to it about half a teaspoon of oregano and about half a teaspoon of our uh, all-purpose seasoning, which if you watched other videos, you know what that is. So, you know, the sauce is kind of your call. Uh, we sometimes use, if we have our own tomatoes, of course we'll use our own sauce, but uh, we don't right now. So, that's roughly half of a 15 ounce can. So if you're doing two pizzas, one of those 15 ounce cans of good quality tomato sauce works well. And add some like oregano or garlic powder, whatever you want to add to it. So we'll just pretty well evenly distribute that sauce. And then what I like to do is add a little bit of, of shredded Parmesan cheese over the sauce. It, it kind of kind of dries it out a bit. That's probably, oh, I don't know, four ounces or so. And then to, what we're going to do is add our basil that we'd harvested over at the West 40 there. So we're going to put that underneath our our cheese topping because if you put it on top of the pizza, you're just going to end up having just charred basil. And this will cook nicely underneath. There aren't a lot of people in March, when it was six below last night, who are harvesting basil that looks like this out of their own houses this time of year. Okay, so now once we've done that, we're going to go ahead and top that with, I have about two cups of a shredded pizza blend cheese. Just go ahead and evenly distribute that. If you don't think you need it all, you certainly don't have to use it all. But I think we do and we will. Okay, now another topping. These are some of our, our dried tomatoes that we, we dry them in our dehydrator and then I, we keep them in the freezer and then rehydrate them in some warm water. It only takes about five minutes. And then drain off the water and then put, coat them in a little bit of olive oil and we find that they make a really nice topping. They, they have that kind of tart tanginess that really kind of mimics and replaces something like pepperoni. This is gonna be a meatless pizza tonight. So we have some mushrooms, some sliced mushrooms to put on. And some black olives. How's that sound? Okay, now, you know, when we used to make these pizzas, and, well, first of all, we'd make them on a pizza pan, and they were a thicker crust, and the crust was generally kind of doughy and thick. And then we went to a... A pizza peel. <laughs> this is basically a, a relic now. It just hangs on the wall. But you know, we had the store when we used to use it. 
but trying to get a pizza like this to slide off a pizza peel, you would have to put so much flour or so much cornmeal on that peel that basically the smoke alarm would go off in the house within minutes after putting it in there. It was a mess. Parchment really has revolutionized pizza making, home pizza making, and has made it so easy. A pizza like this, which is heavy and wet and loaded with toppings on an incredibly thin crust, can be easily slid into the oven. So that's where we're going to head now. So, remember we have preheated our oven to 500 degrees. And what we're going to do is set the pizza on our transfer board and just lightly rock it. Keep the angle pretty shallow, just lightly slide that off and it fits on there perfectly. And we will set the timer for exactly 10 minutes. Now that's because we know our pizza is baking at 500 degrees. If you're not sure of your oven's temperature, use a thermometer and you, you might have to crank it up or down or whatever a little bit. Now when it's time to take the pizza out, we're not gonna use this anymore. This thing will last us forever if all we do is put a, a dry pizza in the oven. It's in the oven for just five seconds, but we're not gonna slide the pizza out on it. By that time, that pizza is durable enough that we can, we'll slide it out on a pizza pan. So, we'll see you back in 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes. Now again, this is easy enough. Just grab a piece of the parchment and slide it out on a pizza pan. We don't need to use that transfer board. So we're just gonna move this over to the cooling rack. Now, what you can do at this point, if you want to really kind of keep your pizza crispy as it cools, just slide it off the parchment. And the, even though this pan has perforations, just slide it off the parchment, let it, let it cool for a bit. And let's see here, if I can show you the bottom of this. Can you see the bottom? Yeah, nice and crispy. Crispy crust, crispy bottom. And we're just going to, when, once this cools a little bit, sets up a little bit, we're gonna slice it into squares, of course. Now, one of the things, one of the things I think uh, differentiates a Midwestern pizza from that stuff that, you know, Peggy ate in New York City and all that, the, you know, they slice it in these big triangles. Well, they could do that because the crust is thicker. And one reason you can't cut this into big wedges is because the crust is so thin there's not enough crust to support that much real estate. We need those small squares in order to be able to support all of that filling on that small amount of, of crust. So there you have it. Pretty quick and easy. You know, for about 16 bucks, you can buy a whole case of 28 of those tiles. You can buy a sheet of the hardboard that'll make three of those for three and three fifty or something. Go get two of your friends, and those two purchases will make three of these kits that you can use to turn your own kitchen into a Saturday night pizzeria. So, till next time, is Mark again with Backwood Basics. Hope we get outside soon, but until then, let's keep cooking together.